no deal means no compromising on the future of Oregon's young people. And we're standing here today because climate inaction is not an option. The climate emergency is here and Oregon's young people are living it. In Oregon alone, we remember, it wasn't very long ago, when temperatures were at 115. We saw drought drying up so many areas. We saw smoke choking neighborhoods. And we saw wildfires, like the bootleg fire this last summer that was devastating. And so Oregon's young people, in every nook and cranny of our state, are telling me, as their senator, enough. So we're going to hear from several of them today, and they're going to talk about how important it is to them that Oregon act on climate now. Not a year from now, not some vague time in the future, but now. And the next few weeks in Washington, D.C., provide that opportunity. And it is especially important for the billionaires and the multinational corporations to pay their fair share in the fight for the future of our planet. Now, before everybody's eyes glaze over with a lot of complicated talk about taxes, I want everybody to get just a brief assessment of what I've been doing with respect to the tax code, because that is a key to actually reducing carbon emissions. My Clean Energy for America bill is the linchpin of the Congress's effort to grow clean energy and support thousands of good paying jobs. Right now, the tax code's built for the special interests. There are 44 separate tax breaks on the books, and many of them are relics from yesteryear. What I do is deposit all them in the dustbin of history and say, for the future, we'll have one for clean energy, one for clean transportation, and one for energy efficiency. And what that means is we'll have an opportunity with this proposal leading the way to get to the target for 2050 to actually reduce carbon emissions and promote a healthy, cleaner future for these young people. With my bill, we can get rid of toxic pollution that poisons communities, especially low-income communities and communities of color. We can incentivize the transition to cleaner transportation, and we can have more good-paying union jobs here at home as we grow clean energy and grow our economy. And I'll just close by way of saying, I know people might hear this and they'll say, how are you going to pay for it? What I've pointed out is everybody in Oregon has read about how billionaires are paying little or no income taxes because they have set it up with their accountants not to take a wage. So my billionaire income tax will go a long way to paying for the climate response that we're going to be making and ensuring that here in this beautiful green space in Cully, something that used to be a landfill becomes the kind of model we have around Oregon. So we've got terrific group of people. We're first going to hear from Cassie Wilson with the Sunrise uh, Movement. Then we'll hear from J.J. Uh, Klein Wolf with the Portland Youth Climate Strike. And then we'll hear from Lane Schaefer, McDan McDaniel uh, High School student and a transportation advocate. Cassie, come on ahead. Hi, my 
my name is Cassie Wilson. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a member of Sunrise PDX. I'm 23 years old, and I live in Boring. I'm here today and in the fight for climate justice every day, saying no climate, no deal, because living in Clackamas County, I've experienced firsthand what our present and future look like if we don't take the bold climate action we need. Most of my memories from the 2020 Labor Day fires exist as sound bites from the local news in my head. I was standing in the kitchen, sobbing, begging my parents to pack at least the bare essentials when the news came on and said, all of Clackamas County is under at least a level one evacuation order. It felt like the entire state was on fire. The blue sky turned to gray as the smoke rolled in over town. Tears welled in my eyes as we drove away. All I could think about was how many disabled people get left behind in climate disasters around the world. My mom and I voluntarily evacuated to avoid joining those statistics. The news wasn't much better the following days. Crews have stepped away as the fires have become too dangerous to fight. Officials fear the two fires may be merging. A few days later, lucky to have evacuation zones beginning to lift, we returned home to some of the most hazardous air quality in the world. I felt my worldview shift that week in September as it hit me that the impacts of climate change were already here. Over the past year, the Pacific Northwest has continued to feel its impacts in the form of ice storms, record-breaking deadly heat waves, more wildfires and smoke-filled skies, and worsening drought. I've never seen Mount Hood as bare as it was by the end of the summer. I've always been concerned about climate change, and the past year has made it impossible to ignore. I fear what will happen if we don't take the bold climate action we need to stop this crisis. I fear that we will continue to see the devastating fires, floods, droughts, and heat waves. I fear that the people in power will maintain the status quo by continuing to put profits over people and the planet. I fear that more people will die at the hands of inaction. I fear that my generation and every generation after will have to continue to carry the weight of the world's problems as we beg for a livable present and future instead of doing whatever it is young people do when we're not constantly organizing climate strikes and testifying at obscure government committee meetings. It doesn't have to be like this. We know a better world is possible. The reconciliation bill provides our first shot at huge steps forward on climate action. We can end fossil fuel subsidies to reduce emissions and free up money for further climate action. We can create a civilian climate core. We can reconnect communities and incentivize the use of no carbon transportation. And what feels like the biggest thing to me right now is we can get the entire country on a path towards 100% clean electricity, something that Oregon has already been a leader on. This reconciliation bill will make it possible to bring about even more actions we need to protect people and the planet because we know this isn't enough. It's just the beginning. Because we also need to protect our right to clean air and water. We need to put people over profits. We need to protect our forests because their potential to store carbon and help get us out of this crisis will mean nothing if we continue to allow corporations to come in and clear cut them. We could instead create jobs that allow workers to care for our forests. We need transportation justice. Investments in alternatives to driving in rural communities is essential to our climate future and to making sure that people who can't drive can still navigate our communities. Young people deserve the good green union jobs that we're fighting to create. We need housing for all, health care for all, racial justice, disability justice, land back, climate resiliency, and so much more. And honestly, after reading the news yesterday, I was really frustrated that our system is so broken that our shared future rests in the hands of one senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin, who is being paid by fossil fuel companies to maintain the status quo, despite millions of people begging him to do otherwise. I wasn't going to call Senator Manchin out by name today, but then I thought more about it and I was like, I have nothing to lose by calling him out, but we have everything to lose by not continuing to put pressure on him. So I'd like to thank Senator Wyden and other members of Congress and fellow activists for continuing to keep up the pressure to make sure that climate doesn't get cut from this bill. The impacts of climate change are already here and our present and future are at stake. 
Climate action is not negotiable. No climate, no deal. Thank you. Cassie, thank you. And um, Cassie, just so you know, we're going to make sure clean energy for America, that bill you're talking about, is in reconciliation. Count on it. Thank you. Well said. All right. Our next speaker, J.J. Klein. Whoa. Am I, am I going to take a mask off? Hello everyone, my name is JJ Kleinwolf and I am a sophomore at Ida B. Wells Barnett High School. I am an organizer with Sunrise PDX, but I speak to you today as a member of Portland Youth Climate Strike. I will be talking about what the city of Portland can do for youth in the climate movement. On September 24th, thousands of high schoolers walked out of school and marched across the city to bring attention to the climate crisis that we are currently living in. We demanded then and demand now that Portland leaders take climate action in all of their policies. Since many of us do not have the power to vote, we must resort to these extreme and drastic actions to make our voices heard. While doing outreach for the strike, there were many people who I came in contact with that thought it was pointless or just an excuse to skip school and that we wouldn't make any real progress. Since then, Portland Youth Climate Strike has met with Mayor Wheeler as well as been in contact with multiple county commissioners. We are showing everyone, young and old, that our voices are just as powerful as adults, so long as we are being supported by those in positions of power. Portland has experienced numerous climate-related disasters in the past year, and we will continue to face these disasters in the future. We are facing extreme temperature changes, floods, and wildfires, Whew. that the city is not putting money into projects that will help solve these issues. You may think, well, we're just kids, but in reality, we, as the youth, are experiencing the effects of these policies more than anyone else. Freeway expansions going directly onto our school grounds, heat waves preventing us from leaving our homes, and wildfires forcing us to evacuate the spaces that we should feel most safe are some of the many examples of ways Portland youth are directly impacted by climate change. Every Portlander must view structural and interpersonal issues through a climate resilient lens. The future of our the future of youth and Portland depends on the policies and actions taken today, and every decision passed has environmental consequences. Carrying this weight of climate grief and fear on top of regular teenage emotions and struggles is really intense. I should be worrying about what I'm going to wear to the homecoming dance or what my score on the SATs are going to be instead of if I will have a safe planet for me and my family in 20 years. There are times that I feel so hopeless knowing, I'm, uh, knowing I am unable to vote for who represents me and my future or what policies will be put into place. However, I am still your constituent. And under those, pretense, under those presences, it's your duty to represent us and protect our future. With that being said, the leaders who are in or plan on running for office need to listen to us. We are the next generation of people inheriting this planet. We will be the ones forced to start families, raise children, and live the rest of our lives here. Our Current leaders must listen to us and understand that we know more than they might think. Future climate action starts now and starts with listening to our youth. Thank you. You give us a lot of hope with all of your comments. Thank you. Let's hear from Lane Schaffer, please. Hi, my name is Lane Schaefer. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a student at McDaniel High School and a transportation advocate. It's time. It's been time, in fact, it's far past time to prioritize clean energy over profits for big oil and other corporations. I'm proud to support Chair Wyden in reforming our tax code to create a more sustainable future that can support my generation. It can be difficult for people to see the importance of tax codes. They seem foreign and unrelated to the climate crisis, but I cannot stress enough how critical a component they are to curbing the climate crisis. Until we provide economic incentives that make clean energy more profitable than its cheaper, more harmful alternatives, private businesses are unlikely to abandon harmful energy sources. We must encourage the development of electrified transportation and the infrastructure to support it if we are to lower carbon emissions and the like. As an advocate for sustainable and equitable transportation, I've worked alongside so many incredible and motivated youth, all who have the same message. We must make significant efforts to curb the climate crisis. Youth have been especially impacted by the climate crisis, as the previous speakers mentioned, both physically and emotionally. The toll of having to advocate for climate action from our representatives 
takes a toll on your mental health, and we have more important things to focus on, like school and college, but we can't because we inherit the world that comes to us. We've seen the effects of climate change. We've experienced the fires in Oregon. We've watched from afar as hurricanes wreak havoc along the East Coast. It's time for meaningful change in our energy tax incentives that will stimulate the production of clean energy and transportation. The climate crisis is not distant. It is here and now, and we cannot let it worsen. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Liam, thank you. And here's what we'll do um, for the folks in the, in the press. Um, we'll all come up if you have any questions for anybody who's spoken or anybody else. I want to just make one other point. Um, Lane, you talked about the, the tax uh, bill that I've written. This will be the first time where the more you reduce your carbon emissions, the bigger the tax savings. And on 100 years, the tax code has never been used to do more to help promote a clean environment. They give out all these tax breaks year after year, but nobody ever tied the tax break to actually reducing carbon emissions. Now we're sending a message to everybody. The more you reduce carbon emissions, the bigger your tax savings. So let's take any questions you all may have.